Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Luigi Zingales. I'm the faculty director of the Siegel Center and the co-host of the podcast Capital Isn't. We're delighted today to continue our Economic Effect of COVID-19 workshop series with Guido Lorenzoni and Fernando Alvarez. Please note that we will record the presentations and post the videos on our YouTube channel, but the question and answer portion in the last 30 minutes is not recorded, and so is off the record. You can submit your questions and comments via the Q&A button on Zoom, and I will moderate uh, the questions. Before we begin, let me briefly introduce our two great speakers. The first one is Guido Lorenzoni, he is the Breen Family Professor in the Department of Economics at Northwestern University, and his research focuses on business cycles and financial crisis. Today, he will present his paper, Macroeconomic Implication of COVID-19, Can Negative Supply Shocks Cause Demand Shortages? Joined with Veronica Guerrieri, Ludwig Straub, and Ivan Verning. The second paper will be, a sort of presenter will be Fernando Alvarez, is the SIEP family professor in economics at the University of Chicago. His uh, recent research focuses on the dynamic general equilibrium models applied to asset pricing, search, and insurance. And he will be presenting his paper, A Simple Planning Problem for COVID-19 Lockdown, with David Argente and Francesco Litti. Now I turn it over to you, Guido. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Luigi. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me and giving me a chance to uh, discuss uh, my work. This is, uh, yeah, this is a joint work with uh, Veronica Guerrieri, Ludwig Straub, and Ivan Berning. <clears throat> and uh, it's, a, it's a paper where we kind of develop a, a kind of a simple framework uh, to think about the effect of, of, uh, of the pandemic. Um, and uh, kind of the theme that we're exploring is how uh, a shock that has a, starts as a kind of very asymmetric, as having very strong effect on some parts of the economy, then kind of uh, uh, migrates and, and travels through 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 the economy. And uh, and the main uh, I mean the main idea is that uh, you, you, to think about the effects of this shock, you need a multi-sector economy. Uh, and then, and and that the shock is not the same as a shock that would affect uniformly all. Guido, you are unmuted. I don't know what happened. Guido, we cannot hear you. I'm I'm back. Sorry, I don't know okay, why good. I got completely disconnected. I hope. That's all right. It happens in the best families. <laughs> um, all right. Okay. So, what is um, so when the when when the when the uh covid 19 started spreading uh a question that just came up very very naturally was uh is this going to be mostly a supply shock or a demand shock part of the reason why initially the focus was a lot on the supply shock is that originally the sh the, the pandemic was more located uh, abroad and located in china so a lot of the concern early on was that some some parts coming from China would not make it to, to U.S. manufacturers, so so it was clear that the, that the concern was on the on the supply side. Uh, once the shock arrived in, in in the U.S., then the question was, okay, this is going to be partly obviously a supply shock in the sense that if some workers uh, cannot go to work safely, uh, that is just going to reduce the, su the the supply of goods and services, and uh, and then at the same time we we can imagine that the effects are also going to affect the demand side. And uh, 
natural question is whether the shock on the demand side is going to be stronger or weaker than the shock on the supply side. And that is a natural question kind of for policy because depending on which of the two shocks is stronger, the, the prescriptions for policy response are very different. Like if we, if we expect the shock to be mostly a supply shock, then a, a, a fiscal stimulus or a monetary stimulus would not be a good idea because it will just kind of push people to spend more when, when there is fewer goods and services that can be produced. If instead there is a, a, an element of lack of demand and the element of lack of demand is actually dominating, then the logic of stimulus is more appropriate. So that's why we started um, uh, posing that question. Uh, So the point of this paper is to make a general point that then is applied to the pandemic. And the general point that we make is that it's possible that if a supply shock is localized in a certain area of the economy, even a pure supply shock that hits one area of the economy can then travel and actually cause a lack of demand overall in the economy. And uh, key ingredients that can generate this transmission is one is an element of complementarity. So that when some goods and services are no longer available, then people don't want to spend on other goods and services. And the other channel through which the shocks travel is through incomes. It's through the fact that when people lose their income in this sector, they can no longer spend in this other sector. And so what we do, or what I'm going to do is to just uh, walk through the argument for why both ingredients are, 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 are uh, necessary for, for the story. And then I'm gonna uh, uh, later connect to some recent evidence and, 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 uh, and to the policy debate. And that, that's the plan, okay? So I'm gonna go through a very simple one sector model just to give the basic idea why, what is a traditional negative supply shock and why it doesn't have this uh, we use this Keynesian supply shock label to, to, to represent a supply shock that has even bigger demand effects. So in a one sector models, you cannot get that, but in multi-sector models, you can. And, and the two forces, as I said, is complementarity and incomplete model. So let me start right away. Uh, Luigi, I have a half an hour, right? Yes, you do. Yeah, perfect. So. Let me go straight away into a, a very basic model, like as, as simple as it gets, just to, to make this point. So I take an infinite horizon, standard preferences, and there is just a fixed endowment of labor. And output is produced with labor one for one. So output is labor. So in, a, in an economy like this, suppose that there is just a reduction in labor supply, that like a fraction phi of workers have to stay home so to avoid uh, getting sick. And so that's the only thing that happens. And then tomorrow, everything goes back to normal. And so that's, that's the simplest exercise one can do. In an environment like this, we can ask two questions. First, we can ask what happens to the real natural rate, so to, to the natural rate of interest. Uh, and then we can ask if the central bank for some reason cannot reach the natural rate of interest, what happens to employment? And of course, the, the two questions are always like two sides of the, of the same question. And, and, and so we do both things in the paper. We look first at what happens to the natural rate and then we keep the, the, the policy rate constant and we ask what happens to uh, aggregate activity by having a simple, uh, a simple form of, of uh, a nominal rigidity in the paper. It's just a simple form of wage rigidity so that we can have like a, a lack, of, lack of demand. And uh, the answer in this case, what happens to the real natural rate? It's very simple because output today is small, tomorrow is gonna be high again when, when we go back to normal. So consumers perceive that the consumption path at full employment is gonna be increasing. And so the natural rate has to increase. And the fact that the natural rate increases means immediately that if instead the central bank keeps the rate constant, we're going to have an excess demand. So we're going to have excess demand and inflation. So this is a totally traditional supply shock that doesn't cause uh, deflation. It doesn't cause uh, uh, extra unemployment. It just causes uh, uh, a, a drop in employment, but, but uh, inflationary pressures 
And this is a shock where like uh, expansionary policy would not be a good idea. Okay, and so here's just the math for what I just said. Just like how do you get the natural rate? You just plug the full employment levels of, uh, uh, of output in the, in, the, in the Euler equation of the consumers. And because con consumption today has to be lower than in the future, we get the natural rate going up. And then what we do in the paper is we expand a, little, a, a bit on this idea. We show that even with incomplete markets, so even if you add the idea that some people lose their job and the people that lose the job are gonna spend less, you think that that would already give you a demand response and indeed it does. So in, indeed, once you add incomplete markets to the picture, supply and demand starts to be more intertwined. So you get an effect like that, but that effect is never strong enough. So even in a world with, uh, with incomplete markets, you don't get, you never get that a supply shock as an effect on the map bigger than the initial supply shock. And the intuition for that is just that marginal propensity to consume are always smaller than one. Uh, they, they can be large with incomplete markets. We, we, we can have high MPCs, but it's never bigger than one. So the force is never too strong. Okay, and so that's uh, our basic proposition. With one sector, you cannot get a negative supply shock to have uh, kind of Keynesian features. You cannot do it with complete markets and full insurance. You cannot do it with incomplete markets. So now let's go to the multi-sector model where, where, where the interesting, uh, the interesting uh, uh, stuff happens. So, okay, so this is a little box that we use to kind of uh, represent the, the, the results of the paper. So we have seen the first, two, the first two boxes in this picture. Complete markets, one sector, it doesn't work. Incomplete markets, one sector, it still doesn't work. And this is a bit a newer contribution of the paper. But now we can go to multiple sectors. So with multiple sectors, we're going to have uh, the direct effect of the lockdown of course that was going to be that one sector closes and we're going to do the experiment in a very simple economy where there's just two sectors one sector is like the exposed sector is like contact intensive people have to meet like restaurants and then there's going to be the rest of the economy and we're going to assume that the rest of the economy can go exactly as before which is of course an extreme assumption but we want to be very 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 stark okay so Think of the other sector as, uh, I mean, the extreme example is, I don't know, somebody that produces video games, they, the, the, the software engineer makes the video game and sends it to you via, uh, via the web. You don't have to meet, you don't have, nothing has to change. We can just produce exactly as before. And of course, the, the reality is much more continuous. There is sectors that are more exposed or less exposed, but this is the, the thing for now as too extreme. One sector is exposed, the other sector is not exposed. And so the question is like, when people can no longer buy good one, when people can no longer go to the restaurant, they're gonna save some money because they're not spending money on, on those goods. And the question is like, would they spend more on the other goods? And of course that depends on the degree of substitutability between the goods in sector one and the goods in sector two. So the first observation is that once you have multi-sectors, the degree to which the different goods are substituted is going to matter for the answer. So let me just lay down the equations just just to 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 just to to have them on 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 the uh, on the board. It's the same simple infinite horizon economy, but it's just with two goods. We call them good one and good two. A simple CES preferences to aggregate between good one and good two. Rho here is the inverse of the intratemporal elasticity of substitution between the two goods, and sigma is the inverse of the intertemporal elasticity of substitution. So, as before, output is produced linearly with labor, so technology is very simple, and uh, uh, as before, now there's going to be a fraction phi of workers that produce good one, and a fraction one minus phi of workers that produce good two. The fact that the phi in the, in, the, in the production side is the same phi in the preferences is just a nice normalization. So the, the relative price of the two goods is one of the two goods is one in a steady state. And we're gonna do uh, 
MIT shock, like at date zero, there is a shock and sector one has to close. So think of this as a stay at home, certain goods and services can no longer be exchanged in this economy. And the question is like, what is gonna to happen to trading in sector two, which is still open and active? Uh, are, are, is there gonna be a recession in, in sector two or is, gonna, or is there gonna be inflation and excess demand in, in sector two? Uh, once more, we can look at the question by looking at, uh, uh, at the uh, full employment version of this economy and ask what happens to the natural rate. Once more, we can, and here we are with complete markets, so all the workers are perfectly insured, or you can think of all the workers are part of a big family that shares income uh, uh, between themselves. And so then we can look at the Euler equation of the representative agent. And now the, the novelty is that the Euler equation of the representative agent now has the marginal consumption of good two in period zero and in period uh, one, so in, in today and in the future. And now you see that the consumption of, of good one goes to zero. Uh, consumption of uh, good one is gonna go back to C1 star tomorrow. And then if we want to keep the economy at full employment, the consumption of, of good two has to stay the same. Uh, notice here, I'm using a version of the economy where there is no mobility at all between sector one and sector two. So the productive capacity in sector one and two remains exactly the same. The workers in sector one cannot move to sector two. In the paper, we also discuss what happens with labor mobility and, and, and I don't know, at this time, maybe I'll say a couple of words, but uh, not for now. So once we have the preferences above and we kind of plug all the, uh, all the expressions above in, in this equation, we end up with this condition. And you see that this condition tells us that the real rate will go down if and only if this inequality is satisfied. And this inequality, one minus phi is a number smaller than one, so this inequality is satisfied if rho is bigger than sigma. And now what does it mean that rho is bigger than sigma? Well, remember that one over rho is the elasticity of substitution between goods, one over sigma is the elasticity of substitution intertemporally. So what we need, the condition that we need is that the intertemporal elasticity of substitution is uh, uh, bigger than the intratemporal elasticity of substitution. And, and so we have a picture like this uh, where uh, you see, I put the intratemporal elasticity on the x-axis, the intertemporal elasticity on the y-axis, uh, and uh, kind of the, the pink area is where you do get a drop in the real rate. Why are this uh, elasticity substitution what matters? Well, the intratemporal is intuitive. I already mentioned it, right? If, uh, if uh, the goods that you can no longer buy are uh, sufficiently complementary to the good that uh, you can still buy, then you're gonna buy less of them. The intertemporal matters because like you know that tomorrow, the first set of goods will be available again. So tomorrow you'll be able to go to restaurants again. And so the high intertemporal elasticity of substitution pushes you to kind of save money so that you can spend again tomorrow when, uh, when you can go back to a consumption basket where everything is in there. So that's the first force. And so far, we did everything in complete markets. The next message of the paper is that once you kind of overlay this uh, uh, environment with incomplete markets, once you assume that the workers are no longer part of a big family, but the workers in sector one actually lose all their income and the workers in sector two don't, don't give them insurance, then these forces are reinforced. So the idea that income losses can help propagate shocks from one sector to another in the economy, it's, uh, uh, it works. It didn't work in a one sector model, it was not powerful enough, but once it's combined with this, actually goes to reinforce uh, the, the, the result. Okay, so now we have this effect of, of income and uh, we go to the second uh, result, which is, uh, Again, I show it uh, in the uh, space of these parameters, intertemporal elasticity and, and intratemporal elasticity. And as you see, once we go to an incomplete market version of the economy, oh, let me just say a word about what is the incomplete market version of the economy. 
I, I didn't put down equation to, to be brief, but the incomplete market version is gonna be very simple. It's gonna be, we're gonna assume that um, a fraction of agents mu in this economy can borrow. Uh, and so they, they can perfectly smooth consumption and they're on the oil equation. And a fraction one, uh, one minus mu instead, sorry, a fraction mu one minus mu can borrow and a fraction mu cannot borrow. And the fraction that cannot borrow cannot borrow at all. Uh, and so it, that is just a simple parameterization. So you, we can go from complete markets to incomplete markets by, by changing this parameter mu. And uh, this picture here, the, the picture on the right, shows you how the possibility of a, of a Keynesian supply shock, so of a drop in demand in sector two, uh, is bigger uh, in a model where there is incomplete markets. And in particular, this picture here is drawn for the limit case in which mu is one, so everybody is constrained. And in that case, we get all the bigger area, the blue area, so we get a whole bigger triangle of parameters for which uh, we get, uh, uh, we get a, a, a drop in demand. So now, if you give me like uh, maybe three, four minutes, I'm gonna try to give some intuition for this result. So the interesting result is that the same economy, the same parameters with complete markets, we're gonna end up with an excess of demand. But once markets are incomplete, so once the people that lose their income so people, well, you know, restaurant workers lose their income and they're not insured, then the potential for a drop in demand is bigger. So to, to give you some intuition for that, I'm gonna use uh, uh, simple consumption functions. So I, I'm just gonna use a graph that plots the res, uh, relation between income today and uh, consumption of good two. So this is gonna be demand in the second sector, in the sector that can still be active. Okay, and so the consumption function looks like this. And the blue line is the consumption function before the shock. Again, remember, this is a consumption for good too. The red line is the consumption function after the shock. And this is in the case in which rho is equal to sigma. So it's in the borderline case in which the, total, the effect with complete markets is zero. So you see that here, the, the red line moves to the, uh, sorry, the blue line moves to the red line. So people for the same level of income would like to spend more, but at the same time, because income fell from n bar to one minus phi n bar, because a fraction of workers don't work, there is a drop in income at the same time. So consumption function moves up, income moves down. The net effect is that actually we have no change at all in the demand for good too. So, there is some substitution, so I spend, because I can no longer go to a restaurant, I'm gonna spend a little more on, uh, on uh, online shopping, but at the same time, because uh, a member of my family works in the restaurant business and lost his job, we're gonna spend overall a little less, and these two things exactly balance each other in this case. What is different with incomplete markets? So these are the consumption function with complete markets. With incomplete markets, the consumption function are gonna look like this kind of piecewise linear. So the, and this is like, a, of course, a, a, a manifestation of a much general, more general principle, which is that with incomplete markets, we get like uh, concave, uh, concave shape consumption functions. So that the MPC, when people lose their income, are bigger than when people have a higher income. And, and in this simple environment, this just, they just take this simple piecewise linear uh, 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 shape. So you see here that somebody with the same income, so somebody that remains an N bar, so say a, a tenured professor that, that has his same income is gonna sp end up spending a little more on the on good too, because he's saving on a lot of stuff that is, he cannot buy. So he's gonna spend more on online shopping. And, and, that's, and that's fine. But at the same time, there are some people here that go from N bar to zero. And these are the workers in, 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 in sector one, the restaurant workers that lose all their income. And so some people are gonna stay on M bar, some people are gonna uh, go to, to zero. And with incomplete markets, instead of having that, we go to one minus phi M bar as the average income of the family, we have that actually some people are gonna be at zero, some people are gonna be actually at Y half. Because uh, now we are combining some people that are in sector two with some people that are in sector one but can still borrow. 
And so the average between zero and y hat, the average consumption is not going to be the up on the on the on the on the continuation of the red line as before, because now some people are constrained, so the consumption function is much steeper, and so some people are going to lose a lot of income, and so the the total demand is going to be at the point uh, that kind of uh, that averages between the two points on the on the red consumption function, and that is lower than one minus phi n bar. So the 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 large MPC of the people that lose their income now has a stronger force and pushes down uh, total demand and and then causes a recession. And that's why incomplete markets can flip the total effect on demand in sector two. Very good. So now I have uh, maybe five minutes left, or maybe a little, can I a little more to tell me? Thanks. So let me, sorry. I, I think you're muted, so I, I, I'm missing that. Six minutes more. Six minutes, perfect. So I, I just let me say something. I mean, there, there is a, a lot of real time evidence that's coming up since we first wrote this paper. And so I, we look at this real evidence, uh, real time evidence coming up and we're asking, okay, is this uh, consistent with a framework? What does it say? I mean, this, this, I mean, this is a kind of a possibility paper that shows that something is possible, then, then we have to look at it. So there, there is some evidence that suggests that kind of a forces like a Keynesian supply shocks are at work. Uh, and in particular, well, one, one observation that is broadly consistent with, with what, what we point out is that uh, there is a broad contraction in many sectors, that, that many sectors in the economy are contracting. Of course, some are, are contracting more, like leisure and hospitality in, in this picture, and uh, others are contracting less, but overall, there is a contraction everywhere. Incidentally, this actually, this picture, I just got it from uh, a nice paper by Brinca Duarte and Farie Castro, where actually they try to decompose the, the, the forces of demand and supply in causing the contraction. And they do indeed find that uh, demand explains like roughly one third of the, of the contraction that we observe in the, in the US economy. So that's an interesting uh, exercise. Uh, of course, the exercise. So the decomposition between the red pieces and the blue, and the blue parts of this, uh, of this, uh, of this columns is uh, kind of depends on the model that they use. Uh, but the, of course, the total is just uh, raw data. Uh, so that's one observation that is uh, consistent with our story. The other observation is consistent with our story. Uh, of course, the uh, uh, first sign that something is, supply, is a demand shock or a supply shock and that the demand shock dominates is uh, looking at inflation. And inflation, uh, uh, the CPI has been going down for, for three months now, which is uh, uh, pretty striking. Now, as many have observed, the fact that CPI goes down uh, has to be interpreted with some caution because some goods are just not available. So in a sense, it's as if there are a bunch of goods that we, were, that we don't measure where the price has gone to infinity, like going to, to, to a, a, a nice restaurant in Chicago, being safe from infection is, is a good that is not available at all. Uh, and, and that's a perfectly uh, fine observation. Uh, our basic prediction is still okay because our basic prediction is that for the goods that are still traded, uh, the, the crucial thing is that for those goods, there's gonna be a lack of demand. And, and that, that is what we, that's what we identify as a, as a cancer supply shock. But this observation that some goods prices go to infinity are, are, is actually a nice observation which, because it, it gives us an alternative intuition for the result. And the idea is that in a sense, today, the, the welfare-based CPI, the one that we, we don't quite observe, it kind of spikes up because a bunch of goods are not available. And that is another way to think of why the intertemporal substitution matters. Like today, a bunch of goods are very expensive. So I will decide to spend less today because to, I know that tomorrow they're gonna be cheaper. So it's like, a, it's like an expected deflation force which again, we don't, we, we don't see in the data because we don't see the, the, the spike in CPI that eventually is gonna go away, but, but it's, a, it's a different interpretation. Finally, there is some evidence on spending. In particular here, there is some uh, uh, very nice uh, uh, credit card uh, data information that, 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 that um, uh, Farrell, Greg, Cox, Kanong, and Noel have, have, have put together. 
uh, uh, with, with, with Chase data. And uh, here we do see that, uh, of course, there is a drop in spending in, uh, in uh, non-essential uh, goods that are, essential, that, that are those that cannot be bought. But there is also a drop for essential goods that are those that uh, can, can still be bought. So this is uh, consistent with our story. What is uh, more puzzling about this evidence is that uh, uh, the authors of, the, of this study also uh, kind of disaggregate uh, by uh, sectors that are where workers are more exposed um, to, uh, to income losses. And they show that, uh, in fact, it looks like the drop in spending uh, is very similar. So you look at the drop in spending for government workers that you think are more protected from, uh, from, uh, from the income losses uh, of the shock, and they're actually similar to the losses of, of workers in sectors that, that are much more exposed. So that, I mean, first, that, that would suggest that the incomplete markets, like loss of income side of our model, maybe is not playing a, a dominant role in the story. And that may be, and, and it may be that's because of the very strong policy response in terms of uh, expanding and, and extending unemployment insurance, so that, that, that is definitely part of the story. Uh, there are also other possible explanations. It's also possible that uh, people uh, 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 less exposed also have a different spending composition. So there is, uh, there is uh, uh, open interesting questions in, in that area, but this is definitely data that, uh, that we're very interested in. And, and it's also possible, these are data that are very, uh, as you see, they stop in April. So it may be that in the first, uh, that the first effect is mostly due to complementarity and then income losses are gonna kind of more slowly uh, uh, build up. Um, so that's it. I think I'm out of time, so I'm gonna, uh, I, I'm gonna stop here. Thank you very much, Guido. And uh, now is uh, Fernando's turn. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation. Um, let me just... Uh, Share my screen. All right. So um, this is a paper with uh, with David Argente and Francesco Lippi. Um, all right. So it's kind of like a relatively stylized uh, model, uh, which I think now we all, most of us are kind of familiar, the SIR model, like a very basic uh, epidemiological model. And um, as we understand it, uh, one of the reasons um, uh, this, that social activities have a lot of externalities, so that's kind of the reason that we led us to think about uh, directly going to write a planning problem. Uh, of course, there are interesting comparisons with what uh, the centralized equilibrium will be, but we think that it was kind of interesting to go first to, to what the planning problem will be. And uh, we, we wrote a very simple model in which there is a um, trade-off between economic activity and a value of life. So that will be kind of will motivate different policies such as a lockdown or some sort of form of trace and testing. Okay, so, uh, so the model has some features. I think that uh, we wrote it like long time ago for COVID literature at least. Uh, one of the first, uh, uh, um, concerns was the congestion of the healthcare um, system that could affect the fatality rate of people with the uh, infection, especially there are a lot of people at the same time infected. Then we were sort of curious about uh, the effect that uh, and the evaluation of an antibody test. So we're going to sort of think about the effect of having with and without an antibody test. And lately, we have been thinking about more like um, like a way to trace, taste, and <clears throat> test, trace, and quarantine people uh, in different ways. Uh, and, and in particular, how this is complementary or substitutable to lockdowns, both at a minimum amount of time and intertemporally. Okay, so okay, so um, all right, so it's. So we find something kind of natural, we think, like a very important uh, effect of an antibody test. 
uh, also like a di uh, different pattern of how lockdown should be done in the, in the optimal uh, case with and without an antibody test. When we started this project, we thought that antibody tests will be done, will will be will have it very soon, and uh, it's less so the case. But anyway, um, and uh, also we, we we find a quite a strong complementarity, not suitability, especially intertemporally, between lockdowns and a smart form of uh, test, uh, trace, and quarantine. The idea that uh, maybe you want to have a lockdown now so that when you have available test tracing and, and quarantine, you could use it. Okay, so this will be like the messages of the paper. So let me kind of go over it. Okay, so um, I think that uh, probably a lot of people have seen these, uh, 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 these equations, but I'll show it again. So this is the kind of uh, SIR model. So the population is divided in those that are, um, so NT is a total population. So it's divided on those that are um, susceptible. So they haven't been infected yet. Those that are infected and those that they have gone through the disease, so they are recovered. So we're gonna assume that people that have the, the infection, then after that, they're, they're immune. And then this is the, these two are the low motions of the, of the number of susceptible and the number infected. So notice that the number of susceptible goes down because people uh, become infected. So this number and this number are the same. So these are susceptible become infected. So this, the dot is the time derivative. And I would like you to think about this in this way, that uh, think about for a person that is susceptible, what is the probability that this person become infected? Well, that will depend on some measure of you know, how you transmit the virus and the fraction of people that are infected. Then think about all those that are susceptible, then add across them, then you get this product. So this product comes of thinking about, this is the fraction of people that you bump into in the street that they are infected if, if, if you are susceptible. And this is because we had to add across all the susceptible. I'm making this point because I'm going to introduce lockdown and that will be important for the way we introduce it. Okay. And then the law of motion for the infected uh, is just that, well, new infected are those that have been susceptible and become infected. And then with some fraction uh, per unit of time, then, then they no longer have the disease. Either some die or some recover. And death, so which is the, the change per unit of time in the population will be some function phi of those that are infected times the number of infected. Okay, so this function being increasing will, will, will um, uh, be the way that we model the fact that the health system could be congested. Okay, so now I want you to think about how to introduce lockdowns and how to introduce, uh, um, uh, uh, we're gonna call it TTQ for test, trace and quarantine. Okay, so for lockdown, then think about the following. Suppose that you lock down people without actually knowledge of whether you are susceptible or infected. So then if you lock down some fraction of the population, so let's say the fraction L, so then one minus L of this uh, uh, quantity S of people will be in lockdown. So they are no longer uh, there to be exposed to someone else, but also one minus L of those that were infected are no longer there to be exposed. So that means that if you go through this, then these equations will look as follows. You multiply it by one minus L squared. And this is actually that is known in search, at least since Diamond, uh, um, and it's called quadratic search. And this sort of quadratic feature is because it's sort of the interaction between these products. Now this theta is a parameter that uh, less than one that even if you are locked down, then there's still some activities that you interact with people. So going to the doctor, going to the grocery store, et cetera. Okay, so this lockdown is imperfect. But the point of this is that lockdown is very powerful because it doesn't really change beta. Think of beta as some, something about how many uh, meetings you have and something biological for the disease. This uh, goes up with the square, okay. And uh, 
And of course, you know, this will decrease the number of people that are infected, which eventually, you know, will decrease the number of people that die, but it will have a cost that those that are locked down are not working. And that will be the trade-off that we want to analyze. And this cost also will be dynamic because you put people in lockdown today and then you slow down the whole system. So you really need to think about the consequence for that in the future. So we're gonna model this as a dynamic problem. Okay, so that's kind of the, log, the, the way we introduce lockdown. And the way we introduce test, uh, testing, tracing, and quarantine is the following. It's kind of like a different problem because here you're just going to try to look for those that are sick and put them away. So there is an activity of trying to trace them and then to isolate them. But you could kind of take a look at them, you know, and you're only going to isolate and look for those that are, that are sick. So while lockdown doesn't really distinguish between uh, susceptible and infected, the, the trace testing and, and quarantine will. And that, that will mean that you will use it in different circumstances. In principle, also, you will use it, it will be especially effective when there are very few. So now let me go through the math of this. So instead of having, as in the past, in the, in the previous equation, having I people that were uh, infected, now those that are actually uh, producing new infections, that's what S dot is, is the susceptible times one minus Q. Q are the stock that are in quarantine. So these are the ones that are floating around. The other ones are really in quarantine. And of course, if you want them from all of these that are kind of free roaming around, then there could be also uh, a lockdown. But notice the difference. These are only for those that are infected. So I is the total number of infected. Q is the number of quarantine. I minus Q is those that are infected but not in quarantine. So this is the same, so the same expression that is here will be here with opposite sign because these are new infected and then they uh, get recovered with this rate. Then how do you put people in quarantine? Well, the change on people in quarantine, you just test and trace T people per unit of time. And we're gonna assume that this has two costs. There'll be a cost directly of administering this, you know, tracing people, finding them out, and also there will be a cost because once they're in quarantine, they're not working. One is a flow cost associated with, you know, testing and tracing this number, number of people. The other one is a stock of Q are not working. But it's different from lockdown because you are actually concentrated on those that are infected. And remember that the disease will start the virus with almost everybody susceptible and very few infected. So the dynamics is important to realize where would you use one versus the other policy. And more interesting for us, what will happen if you know that in the future you will be able to test quarantines and trace, you could do lockdown now, but not in the future. And that's a policy they want to think. We think that that's kind of maybe what the US is right now. Okay, so now I kind of introduce at least in terms of the dynamics and the different policies. I want to go now through a simple example with only lockdown and then with an example with both policies. So that's kind of like uh, uh, my goal. All right, so uh, let me introduce, um, um, so let me introduce the antibody test. So the notation will be that tau equal to one is you do have the test and tau equal to zero, you do not have the test. So the antibody test, um, allows you to discriminate when you lock down on whether you're gonna lock down people that have been already had a disease and had recovered. And that's gonna be the benefit. And of course, it's gonna change the cost benefit analysis of lockdown. Okay, so, so now I think I'm ready to do write this first simple problem. This will be a problem in which uh, we're going to analyze lockdown, but without yet testing, tracing, and quarantine. We'll do the combination uh, later. Okay, but I kind of want to do this one first, thinking that that's also partly where the US is right now, and thinking about the possibility of having test, tracing, and tracing, uh, in a couple of months having this uh, TTQ, let me just say, so my, my tongue doesn't get entangled again. All right, so, this, uh, uh, so this is, a, this is a present value calculation of all the costs. 
it's going to be discounted by some uh, interest rate that's kind of immaterial for these calculations, but importantly, by some probability that some vaccine will arrive. This is a cheap way to think about that this is a temporary problem. All right. And so this is really, you know, discounting perhaps probability uh, that the vaccine will be here somewhere in between a year and a year and a half. Then for each period, what are the costs? Well, we're going to have W to be what a person produces. And then um, let's, uh, there are two types of costs. There are some that are in, 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 in blue and some that are in red. These are the two costs. The, the ones that are in red, it has to do with the fatalities. And the ones that are in blue has to do with the GDP losses. So let's look at the ones in blue. OK, and this expression has uh, you know, a bit of uh, some algebra inside, but Let's think about first uh, uh, the case in which uh, tau is equal to zero, so you do not have antibody test. So when tau is equal to zero, so you know this term is not there, this term is not there, this becomes a one, so you could forget about this. And then this is just basically everybody, W times one, which is the size of the population, it's in lockdown. So you, the losses will be kind of proportional to that because you cannot really, uh, distinguish between people. On the other hand, if uh, tau uh, will be equal to one, so this term is not there, this is a one, then the losses only apply to those that are susceptible and infected because those are in the past as had the disease, they have, an, they have antibodies and then it can be discriminated. So obviously then, you know, the losses are different and also are different depending on what stage the disease is on because it depends on you know how many people are susceptible and infected this changes through time so this will be important to understand the dynamics and how much you want to use lockdown with and without an antibody test but anyway i'm just trying to explain now the objective function the second part this one that is in red is uh, basically some number we're going to call it the, the value of a statistical life. The, and then this is the number of deaths per unit of time, which will depend on the number of people that are infected in a given moment of time. And in this simple version, in which there is no yet test tracing and quarantine, so no TTQ yet, then the law of motion are these ones. S dot is new infected. And this is, remember, the part from the um, conventional SIR model, then this is the effect of lockdown. This term is the same, and then this is the rate at which people escape from the disease. Okay, so this is a simple dynamic problem problem that one could solve and then get answers once you have some parameters. So let me go through it to, you know, what type of uh, parameters. So there are some parameters that are kind of comes more from the people I think from the study of the disease early on, that has to do with the rate at which the reproduction rate when there were no measures taken, and some other ones that has to do with what is the length of someone being infected. I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty about these parameters, but these values are kind of conventional, slightly on the pessimistic side. Then there is these two parameters uh, that has to do with, um, so, we have a functional form for phi. Phi is the fatality rate, the number of deaths per unit of time. And so remember that this is the number of infected. This is the kind of like fraction of the infected that die per unit of time. So this has to do, okay, so we have these two parameters. This parameter bar phi says that when there are very few people infected, then the case, uh, um, the death per active case is 1%. This is perhaps now in a slightly higher side. So this is not the death per unit of time. This phi is condition of being someone being um, contracting the virus, where is the probability they will die, okay? And this parameter, um, it, uh, forget about you know, wh whatever it is, it depends on the functional form, but it really implies that, the, that if you were to have in a moment of time, 40% of the people infected, then the fatality rate will triple. We'll get to 3%, the case fatality rate, okay? So 1% is kind of high, but probably around the number observed for large populations. And the truth is that 
uh, I mean, luckily, I mean, thanks God, we haven't really observed many cases to see how congested the, the health system could get in. So this is a bit conjectural. Of course, there is some, if there's some uh, in people going through the data in Italy in different places, but it's kind of hard to tease out this uh, kind of seriously. So I would say that this is a bit conjecturally how congested the health system could be, and partly for good reasons. But anyway, so, but we're gonna show you results in which we turn this to zero and then the fatality rate is constant, uh, the 1%. Okay, then, then there is some, um, you know, uh, vaccine coming in maybe somewhere between a year and a half. Then there's a maximum number of people that you could lock down and there is some effectiveness of the lockdown. Okay. And the very important parameter, so there are two that are very important. This one, this fatality rate, and this one, which is the value of a statistical life, for which we're gonna use um, uh, a value of 20 annual GDPs. So this number comes essentially from Jones, Hall, and Clino, which they go through kind of a value of each year, the value of a statistical life, and they go to also what is the probability that you die as a consequence of contracting the disease, a fraction of people with different ages and condition of uh, having a certain age, the expected number of years that you have. So this number is kind of low, 20, uh, GDP, 20 annual GDPs because the disease is go mostly hits people that are kind of uh, old and hence they have fewer remaining years and this is computed this I'm sort of like summarizing and in some sense oversimplifying, but essentially computed by number of remaining years times fatality rate per age, times share of the population with that age. I'm kind of simplifying, but giving you the gist of where I get these numbers. We're gonna also use some numbers that are, you know, 10 times larger, but this is kind of like, to me, a sensible uh, calculation that they did. Sorry, uh, Fernando, but on this number, Number one, Michael Greenston, who's your colleague, used very different numbers uh, yeah. for that. And, and this, uh, unless you, are, you impu impute an enormous senior discount, this, this is a very low value of statistical life because in the United States, would be what, one million per person? It's a little and bit more, we, but yeah, it's uh, maybe a million and a half, but yeah, a number yeah. like that. Th this is... Uh, the number that uh, even uh, Murphy and Topel use is more the order of nine to 10 million per person. And all the, the literature that uses this to pollution, et cetera, use numbers that are in order of magnitude bigger than what you use. So we're gonna report these numbers. We don't think that are reasonable, but the reason why this is different is because this is not something like pollution that affects everybody of, different, of the same age at the same time. It affects people differently. So the calculation that uh, Jones, Hall, and Clino go through it is you actually find the value of an extra year of a statistical, the, the statistical value of life of an extra year for a person of a given age. I, I'm going to oversimplify their numbers, but it's roughly uh, something like three times uh, a year of consumption per year. And then you need to think about what is the fatality rate of people with different ages. If you have pollution that hits everybody the same, then you have people that have many, many more years to live, and then you do this calculation. No, no, no. I, I understand, but the, even the literature, for example, the, the Canadian EPA discounts the value of statistical life of people above uh, 65 at 30%, for example. That's, but, is, that's not, but that's not the, that's not the only issue. The, only, the other issue is that the, the virus basically has almost zero fatality rate with people below 30. And it has a fatality rate of people in our cohort, for instance, of 1%. Mm -hmm. uh, so that actually is very important because it's not just the remaining years, but it's a combination of the remaining years times the fatality rate. So imagine that you have a disease that would only affect people that are 120 years old. Think about what it would be the calculation in that case. Anyway, that's kind of the calculation that uh, all Jones, Hall, and Clino go over. We're gonna show you numbers, you know, 10 times bigger, but anyway, so we think that these numbers that are 10 times bigger, they're not appropriate for these calculations. Because again, it's, the discount is actually in all calculations and the, the difference is that the virus hits particularly, as you know, like the average 
the, the average age of, among those that died is 80 years or a little bit higher. Okay, so, all right. So now let me show you kind of what the policy is. Um, so in this axis, you have the number of susceptible. In this axis, you have the number of infected. And this is a heat map. So then uh, warmer colors are higher. So on all the yellow part, you basically are in full lockdown. And in the uh, blue part, you have no lockdown and you gradually go to there. The disease starts here. With basically one person, you know, somehow contracting the disease and then spreading. This is not a, this is a phase diagram. The disease is gonna travel like this unaffected until eventually it's gonna hit the lockdown. Okay. So now this is a time path. This is for the case in which there is no testing. So notice what happens. So in the, in the middle one, you have a, a fraction of the population that is infected. In red is a case in which there will have been, if you follow the disease, just uh, we, we no change in behavior. That's a red one. Uh, you know, this is a typical curve. And then notice that the curve is flattened. So you see this, this line. And it's flattened because once it gets to something like, you know, seven, eight percent of the population, this is a large number, seven, eight percent of the population uh, infected, then lockdown starts. It goes up fairly rapidly and then it goes down. So notice that the time span, this is from when we started, uh, but what's important is what is the state. The state is around seven percent of the people with a disease. That's kind of much higher than when we started lockdown. Then it goes up and it finishes kind of rather abruptly. Okay. Okay, and, and the whole idea is it, tra it tries to basically get rid of the bump because here there will be a lot of death associated with it. That's kind of the, that, that's the type of policy that you get. Now, let, let me compare this with a case in which you do have an antibody test. Same case with an antibody test. There's a difference. This is a lockdown rate. It's very protracted because it's a much better policy. And it ends much longer, 140 days. Now, this number here is a fraction of the population to which it applies. It doesn't apply to those that recover. And that's why it's a better policy. It's a better instrument having the antibody test. We're going to price it in a second, tell you what is the gains that you get from it. But it's very protected because as times go by, there are more people. Well, it's protracted compared to this case, which is abrupt. It's protracted because here, you know, having locked down when there's a large number of people that had the disease already is very, very costly. You're not accomplishing anything and having the full uh, value of GDP going down. While here, you're all, it's much more targeted. So you do it kind of longer, okay? You start at more or less at the same point because at the beginning, the, the, the disease is in a similar place, but, but you stretch it more and more. It's, it's kind of different what people think. They're not substitutes, they're more complements. You use the lockdown more because you use it more protractedly because it's more efficient. And this is the comparison between the two. This is just the two graphs put one on top of each other. Okay, so we think that this is kind of like more than what the US is, having no really kind of general antibody tests. Also, it's not clear that there is a very good antibody test anywhere, but anyway, so that's kind of the idea. And when we price it, so we could look at the cost in these two cases, then the difference, oh, one, one thing that is interesting, notice that the number of man hours that you lose is kind of the same. These are more protected, it's just as much more efficient. And we find like uh, uh, that the value of this antibody test is around 2% of GDP, of one year GDP. Okay, so, we're gonna we we'll go through BSLs that are like ten times larger. I don't have a lot of time, uh, in fact. So let me just mostly talk about the TTQ. Sorry, Luigi, I, I could come back if you have more questions. I just noticed that it's gonna be too late otherwise. So let me. Th these are the same equations as I had before. I'll just very briefly going to show it to you. This is notice something that I, I put it here in red that every time there is an I, there is a Q. So this suggests that you could reduce the state space to have a new variable, we're gonna call it X, which are those in quarantine 
but not infected. It's not obvious that that's enough because sometimes Q and I shows up separately, but we develop an argument that you could reduce the state space, have a simple problem where you have X and S only. Okay, so we'll do that in the paper, so anyway, so. Now, the, I think what's interesting in this case is that there's a cost of tracing people, tracing T people per unit of time. So suppose the smart tracing will be this case, that the cost is just a function of the number of people that you trace. Then the opposite of that will be random, which is this, ex this case in which if there is 1% of the people that, are, that, that have the disease, you have to catch 1% and you do it randomly, then you need to test 100 people per person. So the cost goes up enormously. So we parameterize this in terms of how smart it is. Okay, so one of them, look, once you have like um, uh, a random, uh, uh, if you do it randomly, it's not really better than lockdown if you think it through it. Okay, but so now let's think about it. There is a cost and benefits of lockdown as we talked before. They said actual cost of uh, tracing people. And there's also the opportunity cost that these people that are in quarantine are not working. Now, let me show you the optimal policy. So um, if we do it for a, a BSL, like the ones that I show you, you basically, um, okay, sorry. And in this case, we're gonna set this parameter kappa to zero, which means we're gonna have a flat, uh, uh, we don't want to, we're gonna have a flat um, uh, fatality rate, say 1% for everybody. So if you looked in this case, you basically are not using lockdown and you basically are not using uh, much test and tracing because uh, the disease is gonna go through this course and it's not going to really uh, touch the part of the state of space in which you will use it, okay? This is with the case in which you're doing random testing. So essentially you're not doing anything, okay? If you do a smart testing, then this is T, how many people you are testing and tracing and quarantine in per period and this is the lockdown. And notice that they're both, they happen in the same places. So they're complementary. And the disease, you don't see it because it starts here and you kill it immediately. Let me zoom into this. It's right there. It starts there, you realize at the time, and then I'm zoomed to this little, little piece that you can't see there. And when you zoom in, you see that you test and trace and you eventually eliminate it. Kind of New Zealand-like. That's what it, we, I would like you to have in mind. Now, the most interesting part, I think, is the following. Let me just skip this. This is what we call the Atkinson conjecture, or Andy Atkinson, that he was telling us uh, this. So imagine that you don't have this testing, tracing, and quarantine today. You only have lockdown, but you're told that, let's say, in you know, 60 days, you will have it. Let's say that we choose the parameters, as in this case, in which you will not use uh, lockdown at all. So in that case, you see here that the lockdown was zero. The, 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 this is the red case. Lockdown zero through time, through, and then the disease will progress this way. Because with a flat fatality rate, you don't want to use lockdown. And now imagine that they tell you, but in 120 days, you actually will have TTQ. What do you do? Full lockdown. Why? Because you want to keep the disease low so that then you could use test and tracing because that's very effective when you have a few people in quarantine. And it has a very large benefit. So this is the kind of intertemporal uh, uh, complementarity. Okay, so this is, for instance, what you want to do, you see like a tiny piece of the state space in which you use it when you are 120 days for learning that you have it. This is 120 days. Now you start seeing, remember the disease will start here, so you quench it anyway. This is 90 days before, and this is 60 days before, and this is 30 days before. And remember that if you actually don't have this, you never have lockdown. So lockdown here is complementary, not substitutable. And this was an idea that Andy was saying that that's why some people in, in particular in the health uh, uh, branch of the government were insisting on having high lockdown in the US 
because thinking that then later on they could use some form of a smart tracing testing and quarantine. Okay, so let me just summarize. I'm sorry that I'm out of time. Uh, this is kind of a simple framework. Uh, it's very costly. We'll do some calculations. That's kind of will not surprise anybody. There's a large benefit of antivirus tests, but it's even larger benefit of some sort of uh, a smart test, uh, you know, tracing, testing, and quarantine. And I'm sorry for the exceeding the time.